Your commentator is Joe O'Brien. Here is the motion picture record released by the United States Navy of the havoc wrought by the Japs sneak sky and sea raid on Pearl Harbor, America's mid-Pacific naval bastion. On December 7, 1941, Japan, like its infamous Axis partners, struck first and declared war afterwards. Costly to our Navy was the loss of war vessels, airplanes and equipment, but more costly to Japan was the effectiveness of its foul attack in immediately unifying America in its determination to fight and win the war thrust upon it and to win the peace that will follow. The Japs copied their German masters in striking hard at airfields. Hickam Field, northwest of Honolulu, and the Fort Island Naval Plane Base were the first objectives of Japan's treachery. Scores of planes were bruised and battered by the Japs' aerial bombs. Many of these were demolished beyond repair. Direct hits were scored on hangars and these were badly shattered. Equipment and airplane supplies were reduced to smoldering ruins. Here at the Naval Air Station is grim and positive evidence of Jap treachery. Here foul blows were struck while Jap diplomats were talking peace in Washington. America lost three destroyers. Here are seen the United States destroyers Downs and Shaw as they rest on the bottom of Pearl Harbor with decks awash after Jap bombers make direct hits on their decks. First to feel the sting of Japanese steel are the USS Oklahoma and Utah, the latter a 33-year-old target ship. Accurate hits by the enemy bombers make short work of these two naval bulwarks. Now with their keels practically out of water, they lie helpless wrecks and a sad reminder of cowardly strategy. To make possible a surprise attack within Pearl Harbor, the Japs built two-man submarines to enable them to fire sneak blows within waters that are narrow and tortuous. Several of these surprise weapons were blown from the water by direct hits of our naval gunners. Others were beached and captured. While sky and sea fire were still raging, salvage crews inspected our naval craft to estimate what may be saved. Before the din of bursting bombs had been silenced, preparations were underway to salvage these two warships. At low tide, the huge propeller of the Oklahoma, stilled by the enemy, was high above water. It is believed that the small two-man Jap submarines carrying dual torpedo tubes were responsible for these two losses to our Pacific fleet. Here is the actual bombing of the mighty USS Arizona by Jap planes. These pictures were made by a fearless cameraman who thought nothing of his personal safety to make possible this record for all posterity. A single lucky hit was responsible for the disaster that befell the Arizona when a Jap bomb falling directly through one of the battleship's funnels exploded in the engine room and set ablaze tons of fuel oil. Dense black smoke billowed to the sky as the massive control tower began to keel over. The Arizona's courageous crew stuck to its guns until the very end. Here was displayed heroism that will live forever in the glorious annals and traditions of the American Navy. The once mighty Arizona now rests on Pearl Harbor's muddy bottom, a pitiful relic of its former self, a grim monument to the treachery of Japan. The once mighty dreadnought's armor plate is twisted and torn, but the great battleship's control tower still stands, a defiant beacon that in days to come will cast its shadow upon Nippon's very shores. At Pearl Harbor, at Hickam Field, in the bomb-pocked streets of Honolulu, ever is written history. History with a tragic, treacherous pen. History that 130 million Americans will never forget. And in days to come, the Japs too will remember Pearl Harbor. Here is a tragic, unforgettable page in the annals of America. Here the cunning deceit of the Japs will never be forgotten. 
Here they hoped to score a knockout before the war began. The Arizona's gun crews battered and broken fired to the last. Their guns pointed skyward from whence the enemy appeared. The Jap sneak blow cost hundreds of military and civilian lives. The treacherous attack cost our Pacific fleet two battleships outright, another capsized, the loss of three destroyers and a mine layer. While bombs were still bursting and flames still pouring from our shattered naval craft, a light United States cruiser valiantly moves out to join the fleet and avenge Pearl Harbor. June 3rd, 1935. The Normandy, $60 million luxury liner, comes to America on its maiden crossing of the Atlantic, an event that occasioned a marine demonstration that will live in history. Whistles blew and sirens shrieked a mighty welcome to the new Queen of the Seas. The famed skyline of America's greatest city formed a fitting background for America's greeting to one of the most stately ships that ever crossed the Atlantic. Six years later, shortly after the United States entered the war, the Normandy was seized and placed under naval guard. Hundreds of civilian workers were put aboard the Normandy, renamed the USS Lafayette, to strip the vessel of its costly furnishings and to prepare it for war duty as a United States transport. February 9, 1942, the Normandy afire. A fatal tragedy to the big luxury liner and to America. As the flames rapidly spread to devastating fury, workers madly scrambled to safety, while fireboats and fire engines poured tons of water into the stricken vessel. All fire doors, vertical and horizontal, were closed to protect the ship's vitals from the flames. But this was all in vain. Dense clouds of thick, acrid smoke billowed far out over Manhattan, casting a mucky pall over Midtown and downtown New York. While the blaze was at its height, hundreds of doctors, nurses, and first aid workers were rushed to the scene to remove the wounded and to administer first aid to scores overcome in their efforts to stem the fury of the spreading flames. Millions stood in awe when the Normandy first reached America on its triumphant maiden voyage. Again, millions lined the New York and New Jersey shores to sadly observe the passing of the doomed and ill-fated ship. Rear Admiral Adolphus Andrews, Commandant of the 3rd Naval District, ordered all hands ashore to save the lives of those who were heroically battling to keep the huge liner upright. Hour after hour, tons of water were pumped into the Normandy, causing a bad list to port, as strong hawsers snapped and tugs strove to push the giant vessel close to the wharf. Then, during the night, the Normandy met its final doom, when, with a resounding crunch of ice and a belch of smoke, the 83,000-ton vessel dipped her flame-scarred superstructure into the surface of the Hudson River. Hundreds were injured when America lost its biggest naval auxiliary. Millions of dollars of damage has been done, and thousands of man-hours of labor have been nullified. Accident or sabotage, the world may never know. But the fate of the luxury liner Normandy, rechristened the USS Lafayette, is one of the major catastrophes of our day.